Good morning, everyone. My name's Rory. If you haven't uh, watched one of these videos before, I'm the minister of the Methodist Church in Haxmin Wigginton and Central Methodist Church in York, alongside my colleague there, Judith Stoddart, who's a deacon. It's almost exactly a year. I think next Sunday will be a year since we last got in our cars, tied our shoelaces, found our way to church and gathered together in a building. It's been a long year. It's been a hard year. It's been a mixed year, full of full of new opportunities and, and discoveries, as well as the desperate longing we have to see loved ones, to travel to people far away, to to just have life return to or be somehow what it was before. Not quite the same way necessarily, but one of the things we've all discovered through these last this last year is is that there are things we treasure, and there are places we treasure, and there are things we've taken for granted. And that continues to be a very rich um, sort of source of reflection for us and thinking about what our life will look like in the future. A lot of lament, a lot of unhappiness, not directed at anybody, a lot of the pain that some folk have felt around the last year um, within the church's life has been the fact that we can't gather in buildings, that somehow we're unable to be in a sacred place, a holy place, or just a, a physical place with other people. And our reading for today, which is set on this third Sunday in Lent, comes from John's Gospel. It's a story about Jesus and the temple. It's from John chapter 2, and I'm starting at verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. It's an interesting story. We find it in a number of the Gospels. We find it not just in John's Gospel, but in some of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in those, it takes place in the last week of Jesus' life. The story is set at the end. In John's Gospel, we're in chapter 2. We're right at the beginning. <laughs> Some scholars say that these are two different events because in John's Gospel there's reference to two Passovers. And so it seems as though, as though, wh however the stories come to be written down, it's there for us and it's a significant story in the telling of the story of the life of Jesus. What does it mean? Well, there's lots of conversation about that. Broadly and bluntly, some people would say, this is a story about holiness and the holiness of a sacred space. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, for some people, it's about, it's about exploitation. It's not so much about the practice of the sacrifice, but that Jesus is railing against the system by which people are, are committed to sacrifice and the way that they are sometimes bluntly extorted in the cause of, of buying the unblemished lamb, the, the goat, the dove. It is, it is fact that, that in the temple of that day, we have that in the record, um, that in the history, that, that the temple was also a kind of bank, that there was, there was money stored in the temple, which, which was used by those who were wealthy as a system of exploitation in, in, in loaning it to poorer people. And the injustice of doing that within the temple would have been obvious to Jesus. In the first uh, Jewish-Roman war towards the middle uh, and second half of the of the, uh, the first century, one of the first things that happened was that the debt record in the temple was burned, which says that that practice obviously had uh, had a profound impact on, on the way the community felt, the society felt about itself. But I want to come back to that idea about holiness, about the temple as a place set apart. And Jesus says, you've turned it into a market, you, you, you're bartering and trading and 
essentially making money out of God in this place. This place is not for that. This, this place is different from every other place where you might do that. This place is a holy place, a set-aside place, a, a spiritual place in some way. It's a place where God is to be found, which is something to think about. Because we still have, all around us, we have religious buildings, particularly in a country like, like, um, like the United Kingdom, this set of countries, let me be careful, like the United Kingdom. We have lots and lots of Christian churches. And lots and lots of, of Anglican and Methodist churches particularly that date from the mid to late Victorian times. In the second half of the 19th century into the very, very beginnings of the, of the 20th. There was a, a an, an explosion in church building or church rebuilding, and often that seems to have been driven in lots of places, lots of little places all over the place, by by competing benefactors wanting to show their, for whatever purpose, with, it, with, it, with whatever sincerity, their love for the community or their desire to be prominent in the community. Um, Anglican and Methodist churches built far beyond the scale of the community's life by people who had money during that very prosperous time for some in England at least holy places places set aside we miss our church we miss being in our church every congregation that has gathered for however long misses being together on Facebook comment after Facebook comment and UK Methodist Facebook pages and other places. You know, people say, how long will it be till our churches reopen? And then there's always someone who says, but we are the church. The church isn't the building. And, and of course, they're right. But that impulse doesn't, or that truth doesn't change uh, the fact of, of, of what it means for us to gather together. And that we've decided to be, as Methodists, certainly, we've decided to be a congregation of people, a, a, a community of people across the country and the world, who on the whole like to have our own building set aside for our purposes. So we might not do holy space, holy places, in the same way that some of our brothers and sisters in churches like the Church of England or the Roman Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church do, where places are consecrated, dedicated, where, where objects become set aside quite powerfully for a single purpose, which is the Christian worship of God in that tradition and that style. We don't do that so much. But we still have places. And it remains true that there are people who think that, that there are things we shouldn't do in our churches. Throughout the history of the Christian church, there's been, um, there have been churches who have refused to have any buying or selling of anything whatsoever in a building. Whether it be a Saturday morning market, uh, a jam stall, uh, whatever, because of this passage. Similarly, there are churches who've prohibited dancing of any kind in any part of their building. Well, we're not one of those, and there aren't many around, but there are some who believe this space somehow, this space is, is set aside, is, is, is holy, sacred, somehow, somehow different from every other place. What we do is we create a place which is other. <laughs> and some of that is good for us. If you walk into a, whether it be a grand cathedral like we have in York or, or elsewhere around the country and the world, whether you walk into a grand cathedral with centuries of history, or as I've done, you walk into sort of little tiny mountain chapels on the Camino de Santiago in Spain, um, or uh, th there is there is some connection. There is some connection to what has gone before in this place, and what has gone before is is the faithfulness of people to what they understood to be the following of Jesus. And their hopes and their longings and their desires and all that they wanted to be in bringing their lives to God and saying, here I am to serve you, to worship you, to, to put you at the center and to spend my life wrestling with what that means. That doesn't mean everybody who's gone to church or feels that precious has done that. Because... One of the reasons why this passage is always going to be important for us is that we, we can make an idol of the building or of the practice that we hold within the building or of, you know, of the decoration or of the symbols or of, of, of any of the things that are part of the church's life. We can, we can make idols of those things when in fact they are signposts for us. They are reminders 
of God and they are signposts towards God, they are not they're not somehow special in that they they contain more of God or they they they, they make the space different from in Haxby and Wigginson's life, the pond across the road. And all that goes on around the pond and in the houses around it and that actually that Miller's Fish and Chip Shop, which used to be a Wesleyan chapel, that's no less sacred a space because it's selling fish and chips than it was when it was a chapel. It's a building. But it but it means something. And it would have meant something quite different to those who worship there than it does to those who just think Miller's make great fish and chips. That's another whole debate. Some people think they're brilliant, other people don't seem sure at all. But anyway, there you go. So what what does this passage speak to you of? Is this Jesus sort of cleansing the temple and making it pure and, and holy and righteous and, and all the things it needs to be for the, the dignity and you know and, and solemnity that, that the temple should be? The temple wouldn't have been like that ever in the life of Jesus. It would have been a bustling, busy place, always a noisy place. Not like the church buildings we go into where we feel we must whisper and where we must sit quietly in hushed tones and our children must behave in quite particular ways. Jesus is taking issue with something. But what is it? Is it the exploitation? Is it, um, is it, is it the whole system of sacrifice? We see Jesus in, in, for example, going up to somebody who he encounters and saying to them, saying to that person, your sins are forgiven. All of that would have, would have only been understood through sacrifice in the temple. Jesus is setting himself up as someone who gives an alternative or is in direct competition with the forgiveness and system, the sacrificial forgiveness system of the temple. Does he have a problem with the whole life of the temple? Where does he see it? It's not clear reading the Gospels what value Jesus places in the temple itself. But for those of us who are part of a church's life, who've spent a year away from our buildings and who are thinking about how we might return in the coming months to being together and being together what in hopefully three and a bit months time back at the end of June will be an unrestricted um, unbounded way what does the building mean what is it for what makes it holy what is holy what is a holy space what is a what does that mean? And have you and I discovered in the course of this last year that though we may have missed the church, we've missed surprising things about the church? Or perhaps we haven't missed it much at all. Perhaps because we haven't missed it much at all, we've found ourselves looking for the holy places elsewhere. Or we've discovered that some places we've always had as familiar places, whether that be our most comfortable chair or a seat in the garden, or you know somewhere we've been and we long to go back to that those are in fact those are our holy places and the question for us isn't about what we do to keep them clean and cleansed and holy and somehow you know set aside for this magnificent uh, project that is that is that is giving honor to god but that they are places of encounter and depth and freedom and forgiveness and discovery and and presence so Jesus clears the temple. He clears the temple in John's Gospel, right at the beginning, right at the beginning. In the others, towards the end, as part of going into Jerusalem and giving his life away for love. I wonder what you make of the story. I wonder where your sacred places are. And I wonder if you've missed being in church, quite what it is that you've missed exactly. And I wonder whether perhaps for you and I there is a little bit of work to do ongoing work about about what we think of the building and what it's for and how we've set it up and what that says about us and what it offers to others and what it says about the God that we think we are trying to do justice to in all of that so there's a little link um, certainly on the Facebook pages that that um, where this will be posted in the post there'll be there'll be a link to to a video of a recording by nick cave nick cave and the bad seeds which i first heard um on an album 20 years ago and it's called god is in the house 
and when I heard it first, I was I was really struck by it because it it pulls the rug out from under so much of what we think the church is and what the church does and what the church offers. A safe, gentle, loving, warm place where we can where we can where we can feel those things. We must be reminded that the gospel is not about safety or warmth. It is about love, but God doesn't always seem to be gentle, and the world certainly isn't, in understanding, exploring, and trying to rip love away from us, or tell us what it really means, when that is exploitative or in unjust. So, if you want to watch that video, do. You might find it uncomfortable. I know I did when I first listened, when I first heard it. And the question isn't so much, well, who does this apply to? But does this apply to me? What expectation do I have? What, what does it mean for me to say, God is in the house? God is everywhere, but certainly with our buildings. God is in the house. I hope you have a good week. Um, I will be having had some time off um, in February just for stress and other things. I'm back at work and we'll be thinking this week and uh, in the weeks ahead about about what kind of regular conversations I want to bring your way, probably after Easter, uh, with a bit of preparation beforehand. Um, looking forward, looking towards a time when we're back in our buildings and when we're back in our lives as they were, and reflecting on, on who we are, what we've learnt, and 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 what pain and weariness we gather, we're, we're we're bringing with us, as much as we're bringing hope, optimism, and an expectation. So bless you. I hope you have a good week, and. Uh, and I'll be back next Sunday.